Um, the College of Arts is an important center for research in this region of the world. And I just want to tantalize you with an example of that because some of you may not realize how much research happens in this college. Uh, with five schools embracing the humanities, social sciences, the languages, indigenous studies, and the creative and performing arts. Just as an example, in 2010 and 11, 37 books, 42 edited books, 192 book chapters, 254 journal articles, 62 exhibits, 13 films, 128 performances, and many hundreds of conference contributions were contributed by our researchers. So I just wanted to tell you that. And one of the great examples of those researchers reside in the School of Social Work and Human Services, our Department of Social Work and Human Services, because that department it truly intersects with scholarship and immediate ways to help our community. Uh, the Department of, of Human Services and Social Work provides students with opportunities to combine academic courses with applied, skill-focused courses, research, internship experiences, and at any given time, there are up to 40 social uh, work students on internships in, in local community agencies, leading, uh, learning to work with our most vulnerable populations. Um, students are researching topics such as violence toward parents, hip-hop culture and youth work, white privilege, social impacts of children's disability on families, and transgender people's experiences of close relationships. So much important work across a broad spectrum. Um, one of the most significant aspects of social work and human services here, and one we're very, very proud of, is our Te Awatea uh, Family Violence Center. Uh, which uh, is doing very important work across efficacy of family decision making, children who have been abused or neglected, and, uh, and it produces a very important journal which is widely used in this country and this part of the world. Uh, one of our important researchers in this area is Pro Associate Professor Kate Van Hoekte, who has uh, made a name for herself in helping people understand the impacts of workplace stress. Uh, she published a book last year entitled Social Work Under Pressure, How to Overcome Stress, Fatigue, and Burnout in the Workplace. I borrowed a copy of that from her and read it and, and uh, found it extremely useful. And that's part of the reason I'm here tonight, actually, is to hear what she has to say. She's also published articles on workplace bullying, professional values, and issues in social work education. And uh, Dr. Van Hoekten has an article currently in press which is entitled Resilience as an Unexplored Outcome of Workplace Bullying. Um, just to think, uh, a, a note about the format for the evening, and then I'll formally uh, ask you to help me welcome our speaker. Uh, there'll be a lecture of up to 70 or so minutes, and then there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. So note some questions down as you listen. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Van Hoekte, who presents her latest research on workplace stress in the aftermath of the recent Canterbury earthquake. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Van Hoekte. Kia ora tato katoa, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Adelson, for introducing me and um, the audience also for attending tonight. There are a number of assumptions, I think, sitting behind today's topic title. What if we could reduce workplace stress in Canterbury is relatively readily answered with a yes. But it presupposes that workplace stress is too high, and if it's too high, that we're able to afford to do something about this. And I think that the answer to all of those is yes, but I'll unpack this in my talk tonight. Before I do so, I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to study this topic. Workplace stress is uh, very high indeed in social work and in human services internationally. And this is without any natural disasters happening. For example, in the United Kingdom, turnover rates in child protection services reach 30% annually. 
These rates are so high that the government became concerned and established a task force in 2009 looking into what caused this, and workplace stress, of course, was heavily implicated. The task force made recommendations, for example, regular health checks and workload management. But despite all of that, there had been no book published on workplace stress in human services and social work for over a decade. And I was approached to look into that and to write a book, which I then did. So I was writing a book on workplace stress. And as I wrote this book on workplace stress, we had an earthquake in September 2010. Now I must admit, our house wasn't damaged. And my first reaction was the university is closed for two weeks. I have some time now to work on my book. I sat at the kitchen table and found it was very difficult to concentrate. Despite us having no visible damage to our house, I was clearly in shock. And so chapter five was intended to reflect on working in the context of trauma. So naturally, I then thought this may be the chapter for me to start writing today, which I did. The book overall addresses common, common causes of stress, compassion fatigue and burnout in social work and human services and what might be done to deal with those. But I should say that even although social work is one of the highest stress occupations, it is also one of the most satisfying occupations. And so stress, does not stand in complete opposition to satisfaction. The two can go together. So I want to also emphasize that. In a book, there's space. There's space to go into detail about signs and symptoms and theories. I don't want to go into great depth around theories of workplace stress today. But there are a few things I do want to highlight. And uh, one of those is eustress or distress. In other words, stress is not a negative thing. Stress is neutral. It just means we face certain demands. Eustress, for many people this is a new word, it's the positive end of the spectrum. It's when stress is a challenge and we're energized and we enjoy being able to overcome the challenges that are placed on us and get excited about the outcomes we're able to achieve. This stress is really about the demands outweighing the resources that we have. We don't have the resources to meet the demands and we don't have the support either to meet the demands. So stress isn't necessarily a bad thing. Indeed, researchers have found that really very demanding and challenging jobs can be incredibly satisfying, and many people go for challenging and demanding jobs. The more challenging a job is, the more important it also is that we have an amount of control over how we carry out our work. And so while I don't want to go a lot into theories, there is a theory that I want to just flag for you, which is uh, internationally well supported and well researched, and it's the demand control support model by Kasserak and Theorel. And this, uh, this theory and research that supports it stresses that the more complex a job is, then the more control we need to have over how we organise and deliver our work. And we also need to feel supported and valued in what we do. Unrelenting, unsupporting demands, of course, lead to distress and physical and psychological ill health and behavioural problems. Things like drinking, arguing, 
violent responses or crying. Often these consequences begin to come out first at home before they emerge in the workplace. Except in the aftermath of the earthquakes where we're all packed in together, the reactions may also emerge quite visibly, of course, in the workplace. When people are exhausted for a long time, eventually they become burnt out. My metaphor for that is perhaps a bit old-fashioned, but it's about cars and motors, and you know, just burning out the motor in the car, working it too hard. And when you worked too hard for too long, you begin to withdraw, you stop being able to empathise, you may seem quite cynical, and eventually people stop investing in work, they withdraw, they throw sickies, or they resign. How do we prevent that? A lot of emphasis is often put on individual means of preventing burnout or preventing exhaustion. And we're encouraged to exercise and to sleep well and to eat well. And of course, the more exhausted we are, the harder those things are. Organisations set up relaxation, relaxation workshops for staff and staff attend them and we all feel like we're doing something. But unfortunately the research doesn't support that that's an effective means of dealing with workplace stress. Really to deal with workplace stress we've got to tackle organisational factors. And so I'm going to talk about some of those organisational factors. Now I said I was in the middle of my book and we had an earthquake and that was the September earthquake. And after the September earthquake we felt perhaps like we were doing pretty well. And When I look back and I read the chapter I wrote for that book it reflects that. It's almost a little bit smug. We did pretty well, you know, by international standards. And it wasn't till after the book was into the publishers that we had another earthquake. We had our February earthquake. And the publishers asked me I wanted to change, if I wanted to change my chapter. And I said, no, I can't. I feel too close to it right now. So I just added a preface to say that we were all pretty shaken at this time but that I felt sure that with the passage of time we would come out more resilient. We're still, I think, in that process of recovery. And even then, I don't think we realised just how long this time would go on and how long these shakes would go on. But people asked me if I wouldn't do some more research on the topic. And at first I demurred, and then it seemed to me that it was the right thing to do, to look into workplace stress in the aftermath of our quakes locally. I sent out, I thought I would have to send out several requests for participation, but I just thought I would start with my own organisation, my association of social workers, and sent out an email message within seconds participants came out of the woodwork and it was only a couple of days and I had about 50 people approach me to participate and now I do qualitative research in depth qualitative research it means interviewing I like to do most of my own transcriptions and of course the analysis takes quite a period of time I should tell you that I've only just started the analysis However, the preliminary themes are certainly standout themes and they match the kinds of things researchers say internationally about what happens in the aftermath of earthquakes and other natural disasters. So tonight I'm going to present some of the surface themes. They're important but they're not systemic issues. And I 
do want to look uh, over time at the larger systemic issues. And some of them you're familiar with because you read about them, don't we, in the press. There are things like loss of democracy. Some of the other themes that begin, some of the systemic issues that I think begin to emerge are genderization of the workplace. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's perhaps what we might call, and I don't mean by this particularly men, but a certain masculinization perhaps of the workplace. And that then leads to particular kinds of patterns of appointments and particular ways of dealing with processes and practices. So I am going to, over time, delve into those sorts of issues more closely as well. But tonight, I'm going to mostly address the topic of workplace stress via those surface or major themes that quickly emerge and that stick in my mind uh, vividly even without having done all the transcripts. And I'm going to do so by using the words of participants and I'm using the words of participants who have read and agreed to their transcripts that have been completed. So just to let you know that too. And of course I'm not naming any people and I'm not naming any organisations because that's very uh, important in terms of helping people and leaving people feel free to continue to speak with me and to participate in my research because included amongst the participants are managers of organisations also. And so assurances of confidentiality are really very important. Schouten isn't a participant, but Schouten does have something to say about workplaces in the aftermath of disasters. In these neoliberal times, as we often hear them being called, there is a notion perhaps that workers are there to serve the workplace. Disasters turn that notion on its head, perhaps, though. Workplaces are there supporting families and communities, and without families and communities, workplaces have no utility and indeed would not exist. Workplaces are far more central to communities than we might realise in ordinary times. If we think back to what happened in and around our workplaces in the aftermath immediately of the February earthquake, then what Schouten has to say makes sense, I think. The extraordinary roles of workplaces in things like identifying identifying where are our most vulnerable people. Clients, yes, but also staff and the families of staff, providing very practical and social support. How are you? What's happening for you? Friendship, but also freezers and fridges and washing machines and showers were provided within workplaces and carted out to the community to be delivered to the streets where staff are working, connecting and networking communities. So workplaces serve a very important function. Workplaces can be a source of great support, but they can also be, as we know, a source of great distress. My research on bullying highlights that and still one of the most common suggestions made to people who suffer bullying is get out, because we still don't quite know how we might deal with that effectively. And some suggest bullying has increased too in the aftermath of the earthquakes. I'm not sure just to what extent that is still quite true. So in my talk this evening, I'm going to have to focus off necessity on some of the things that can go really very wrong. Yet, I think we can also learn perhaps more by emphasising what can go really, really right. What were some of the terrific things that were done by workplaces? And as one participant said, often, actually, really very cheaply.
So what are some of the things that we can learn about that were done really very, very right? So what happened? What did workers do? And what was stressful about that? In their words. Also, I mean, adrenaline had kicked in. We weren't tired. It was pretty full on. Cars, trucks, trailers, station wagons pulling up with people in them. As I listened to stories of participants, it was really very evident that many had wanted to be involved and enjoyed feeling useful in the aftermath and the emergency phase of the earthquake, even although they didn't enjoy what they were seeing and hearing and needing to do. Most were at work at the time. And their first task was to support their clients or their patients. If they were out and about, they might return to work. And some spoke really vividly of moving towards the city centre into clouds of dust and against the stream of people exiting the city. They functioned on autopilot or adrenaline and they spent hours with the wounded. Often they didn't know if their loved ones were safe. And we see here, I said, is she okay, your partner? He said, I don't know yet, I've just got to keep working. For many, this was, it would be fair to say, a choice chose to do that. But the third extract leads us perhaps to question whether we could have been better prepared as a community. From emergency organisations and response organisations with trained personnel, we know that preparedness and support in the aftermath leads to better outcomes for workers. And part of that support is pulling people out, not allowing them to go 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Emergency response workers are pulled out. Whether they like it or not, they are pulled out of the situation and they have to take breaks and they must stop. Most often, as I said, workers volunteered and put themselves into such situations, including in the days and to some extent the weeks that followed. But problems arose when they felt that they hadn't been adequately protected and they were forced or felt forced or put upon to put work before family. One participant said, not quoted here on the slide, it was very much put back onto the workers and these are our expectations and step up. People are furious about that. It's like we've given and given and busted our guts, some of us, you know. And then she went on to say and got nothing in return. Some participants talked about having become much better aware of how critical it is to look after people and to allow them time to look after their families. And some spoke of how they were grateful in a sense for the September earthquake because it is after that they learned just how vital it was and they listened to their staff about how aggrieved they felt when they hadn't been given time with family and so they now did it differently. So in February when it was much more to some extent critical, they knew how important it was and they'd learned that because they went through September. Now we're in the longer term beyond the emergency phase. You may have heard the story of the frog in water. You know the notion, the folk myth, I'm afraid to say it is, that the frog in the water doesn't know it's cooking. 
because the temperature is turned up gradually. And this participant wondered whether we're all a bit like frogs in water. We don't know just how stressed we're becoming till it's too late. We're dead like the frog in the water. Now I'm a researcher, so unfortunately one of the tasks of a researcher is to spoil some of the myths for you, so I apologise for that. In fact, when you turn the temperature of the water up by 2 degrees Fahrenheit per minute, you know what the frog does? It becomes more active as the water temperature goes up, and if you haven't got a lid on that pot, that frog's out of there. <laughs> okay? So the frog jumps out. So there's hope, perhaps, for all of us, just like there is for the frog, unless we put a lid on the pot. Let's not put a lid on the pot. Unfortunately, while humans are actually built to thrive to some extent on short bursts of adrenaline and on challenges, if we face a long haul, like a marathon, in a sense, or multiple marathons, we do need to pace ourselves, we need breaks. We need to be willing to buffer staff and to put in a larger buffer because we're facing more challenges. Some, quite a number of participants, really talked about how they felt aggrieved because in the aftermath of the quakes, they put in a lot of extra effort, excuse me. And they put in that extra effort and it seems as if in the long term the demands haven't been reduced. It's almost as if the extra efforts have been used to recalibrate how much we can expect of people. So that feels like being taken advantage of. And the second participant here, who had, has to be said, perhaps had done more research on the topic in terms of reading the literature than I had at this stage, says it's not rocket science. There's a body of literature. It tells us. And shouldn't we be thinking, oh yeah, people have held together. We've had a bit of a honeymoon phase, the busy phase. We're sort of in the reality phase of the impact on people's lives. And this is the time we really need to be careful. So are we reaching a crisis? Yes, I think we may well be reaching a crisis point. And of course, beyond people leaving, there are other risks like accidents and mistakes, big mistakes. In my neck of the woods, in the human services, mistakes that cost people's lives. And as someone said, what are we going to do? Are we then later on going to blame one person who happened to be around when the holes in the cheese lined up? Or are we going to say, oh, we could have predicted this with hindsight, or even with a little bit of foresight, we could have seen this one coming. So people are raising their concerns and then worried and upset because it feels like they're not being heard. And again, it's uh, fair to say that numbers of participants, when I asked them, as I always do, why this research? Why did you want to participate? They say, well, if I can't get heard on my own, I'm hoping you might be able to do something about that. You might be able to bring this with a different voice and a collective voice and maybe people will start to listen about how worried we really are. What are some of the factors that lead to exhaustion? Well, of course, emotional labour. Workload management should really take account of how tiring it is to listen to people while you're also dealing with your own issues. So helping others when their stories remind us of our own. 
Now, this is a typical issue in human services, but I think it's happening as I listen in shops across the service counter. And after customers leave, I hear staff say, it's so hard to hear, my house has just gone into the red zone too. Such things. Working with more distressed people, whether they're customers, clients or students, means you need to work in a better paced environment, with more breaks between encounters and what I call backspace. What do I mean by a backspace or a backstage? It's the tea room. The extras, it might seem, but actually the essentials. A place where you can kick off your shoes, have time to sit down, have a cup of tea and reflect. Then, when you're with clients, you're able to put yourself out and forward again and focus on them. So managers and organisations that prioritise the need for that kind of reflection and understand it, build in that kind of physical and emotional time space. The participant quoted here rated her organisation as being extremely supportive and was overcoming what you read there is, I think, a sense of feeling very overwhelmed. And she said it's too horrible to look at as a whole. So you just think if I can make it through this week, break it up, chunks. And then suddenly the end of the week comes and you think, okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought. Another common stressor is the environmental stress. We're all familiar with the altered spaces, the hot desking, the shared computers, lack of privacy. Perhaps you wonder what I mean by sterile workspaces. Well, woefully, really. Some organisations, because it's kind of unpleasant when you're sharing a space to come into other people's mess, I'm sure had a policy you're not allowed to leave any personal belongings about. However, we also know internationally from research into what people need in the aftermath of trauma. They need to have some personal stuff around, some familiar things around them, leave them feeling comfortable. And it's, there's this published on, so it's not a, a, a minor matter, it's quite clearly identified as being vital and helpful to people. So when we're stopping people from doing that, we are cranking up their levels of stress and distress, and people won't always know why they are so bothered by that. But they certainly talked about it. They talked about how distressing they found that. There are also issues around confidentiality, of course, and it's harder to talk with your supervisor if you're in the middle of an open plan floor. So certain topics are avoided and never entered into when really they do need to be. Boundary keeping around personal and work time and space broke down. It was difficult to keep boundaries. Some people worked from home, which is a great, terrific thing if you've got your home office nicely set up. But when it's an emergency and that drags on and the workstation's in the corner of your living room and your grandchildren won't stay away from the keyboard or from your paperwork, and every time you sit in your easy chair, there it is, right in front of you, you can't get away, then that becomes a troubling thing because we need to be able to leave work in its place and um, zone out at home. Work, of course, wouldn't always pay for printing and for some that dragged on and then staff would become suspicious, again, that they were taken advantage of. Some reported strong suggestions they should use cafes with free internet connections, somewhat slightly 
dubious, perhaps. Working in some buildings, particularly high-rises, is much harder for many people than they care to admit. Some organisations have deliberately chosen alternative spaces, but others haven't had the opportunity to do that and find it difficult. This is one thing that psychological assistance has helped some workers to at least manage. Driving to and fro work is not only more time concern, consuming, but the constant sight of orange cones reminds us of the state we're in and how long it may take to overcome that. And then for human service workers working in the East, as one said, the worst part is still going into those areas and really seeing just how badly some people are affected. This has also been noted as a strong theme in international research and in the aftermath of September 11, those people working around Ground Zero were very traumatised just by entering into that environment. And we all are entering into that environment all of the time. Now, whether we're aware of it or not, it takes quite a lot of processing, cognitive processing, even just the drive to work. We can't go to work on autopilot. We need to think about it more, and that is demanding. So there are a lot of actual cognitive and physical demands on us um, from the environment and the altered environment. Then there are very complex demands and fewer resources. Working in difficult circumstances is extremely rewarding if we feel we can achieve things. Hochwater, Laird and Brewer did some research on this and they did this in the aftermath of hurricanes in the Mexican Gulf including Hurricane Katrina. They found that people felt very rewarded, but what was critical was that resources were up to scratch. And of course, when they're not, uh, and resources including staffing, for example, in an ongoing way, then hopelessness can set in. We are rewarded particularly by achieving good outcomes. That's true very much for people who go into the human services and social work, not generally, sorry to say, for the pay rates. We're rewarded by having good outcomes, feeling we're really achieving something. And when that's no longer possible, then we really begin to suffer. Middle managers spend considerable time trying to translate head office communications and trying to shield workers from reporting requirements that essentially made no sense in the context of the actual work being done or needing to be done. Or when data was really difficult or time consuming to collect. Staff weren't always aware of just how much effort went into that. And without those efforts, or if they weren't able to be staved off, or if the need to gather data wasn't adequately explained, people began to feel very much micromanaged, burdened, and mutual respect really declined. Several participants also talked about the problem of money being made available to do certain kinds of essentially, usually, earthquake-related work that didn't fit the expertise of staff or really didn't meet the needs of the service users as we understood them, which went beyond earthquake quake-related issues, and that really gave rise to a range of dilemmas. Diverting staff time was very stressful for the staff, especially if there was little buy-in, and they weren't trained for the new job at hand. Yet not going after the money could feel really risky financially. Alternatives, like reframing real service user needs, fit the expectations on paper 
gave rise to moral dilemmas, ethical questions. Is this okay? Kind of not, but... This brings us to another really major, but fearfully, fearfully infrequently mentioned workplace stressor that really increases in the aftermath of a disaster. It's ethical issues. So, much of the literature around disaster management omits mention of the ethics of it all. Difficult decisions have to be made about who gets helped and who is left to fend for themselves. Now we can understand this internationally quite starkly. There are people who get food and there are those who don't. Or water, or medicine. But close to home, workers grieve over the deaths of older persons who are relocated. Some feel without adequate consultation with families. And we know that some of those older persons then died far away from their loved ones. People grieve the inability to help everyone. Or they feel guilty because they didn't stand up to their organisation. Or just because on a day where it all felt too much, they blocked their ears and averted their eyes. People carry vivid memories of walking past others in need. And that really results in remorse, self-doubt and moral distress. And really, we need to understand that this is normal. This is not just you. This is all of us. It's also not uncommon for frontline workers and managers to really question the rationale of decision makers in the aftermath. They doubt the explanations that were provided and they note their suspicion and sometimes they note their knowledge of how uncertainty and instability are at times projected or emphasised so that certain plans that were already in the wind can be promoted and more rapidly advanced as being critically necessary right now to resolve our issues. Lack of communication and involvement in decision making, of course, promote speculation and mistrust, and then over time really lead to disengagement, particularly when people feel that their values and the organisation's values are beginning to part way. People begin to disengage. Once that process is in train, it is difficult to turn back because people start to begin to think about what they might be able to do instead. So it might be helpful for us to understand that workplace ethics and values are central to retaining workers' loyalties and engagement. And perhaps these factors do become more central to the choices people make when they've experienced extreme life-threatening crises and they start asking, What's the meaning of it all? So there are some predictable consequences, and it does draw attention, of course, to the Health and Safety and Employment Act 1992, as amended in 2002, in respect of stress and fatigue. Yes, the legislation requires employers to listen and to do reasonable things, make reasonable efforts to ameliorate problems. But what constitutes reasonable effort is a matter for debate, and it is very difficult, though not impossible, for workers to win cases or to take employers to task legally. If exhaustion is allowed to continue, then burnout does, I think, become somewhat inevitable. Not for everyone, but for increasing numbers of otherwise quite resilient people. Burnout among staff, as I've already said, has long-term consequences, not only for sufferers, but for the workplace, the product, and the customer. And if we're to recover as a community that lives in a city, 
then we need to proceed in ways that are sustainable and promote the resilience of workers. So I want to turn now to some of the really resilience building things that were done and continue to be done and were found to be very helpful indeed. So, studies of responses after disasters show that tangible, practical efforts to offer support to workers and their families on an ongoing basis have the greatest positive impact on stress levels. They reduce absenteeism and compensation costs as well and they improve attitudes towards the company and those efforts don't need to be expensive. In fact, one thing to be aware of is that sharing expensive rewards on the few is counterproductive because you know what happens. What happens is that managers make big mistakes in identifying who's making the greatest effort. They often don't know what's really going on. It's not always the loudest trumpets. And ill will is created really very quickly with the very best of intentions by selecting some people for special attention. Effective help also involves really inquiring into the needs of people and the support needs of people. And as one manager says, it means asking not just how are you doing, but following it up with how are you really doing? And with everyone from the CEO down. Emotional support and interventions are very important not only to be uh, offered to staff, but also, as some organisations understood very clearly, to the family members of staff. Because unless staff are comfortable about how their family are functioning or their loved ones are functioning, they can't function themselves. Peer support, collegial support, is in fact far more often called upon and generally speaking found to be more helpful than professional support. That doesn't mean it's not sensible, wise to offer the opportunity to participate in psychological or professional um, uh, counselling, for example but it is not what people call on most often. It's collegial support. So ensuring that colleagues are able to spend time together at social functions, or as I said earlier in the tea room, is really very important, much more important than we might think it to be under ordinary circumstances. Sometimes I think we think of that as the fluffy stuff. The research suggests it isn't the fluffy stuff. It's really where the business is. Communication's vital. It's most appreciated if it really fits with changing circumstances and it has a clear purpose and it evolves over time. So in the immediate aftermath, yes, it needs to be general mail outs about buildings, safety, do you need to come in to work, but then over time it needs to be much more personal and targeted and it needs to be done as one manager said not by the call centre in Auckland because they haven't a clue about what it's like on the ground it really needs to be done by people who are around we come to decision making I think I've in a sense mentioned some things about this already, but when staff are listened to and trusted to make sensible decisions about what are and are not important activities on which to expend their energies, then they feel energised. Creativity goes up when people experience eustress. But nevertheless, in support of organisations, stability tended to be fostered, and new work was engaged in with caution. Efforts were made to monitor carefully the flow of work 
and in particular reporting requirements were pushed back. That could be really hard work for middle managers and wasn't, as I've already said, always in plain view of frontline workers. Beyond thinking about what their staff had to say, managers in some organisations really made a lot of effort to upskill themselves. They read every book there was to be read, attended workshops and seminars on resilience building, and they reached out also for themselves. Buddying uh, was something that was mentioned as being very helpful, and buddying meant not having someone swooping in to take over, but to work alongside, to check in what are you, what would be most helpful to you right now, what are you most in need of, and then making efforts to supply that. Regular tracking or stock taking of where we're at was also recommended very strongly. I think this quote, and it's a long quote, and I contemplated breaking it up and making it shorter. It's a very important quote, I think. It's from a manager, and it leads us back full circle to what Shelton had to say in my third or fourth slide in about workplaces and communities. This manager believed that Whilst it shouldn't be the motivating force, organisations that develop such a culture will develop their reputation because diligent concerns shown to staff and customers will inevitably be made, themselves, will be made known and customers, by seeing this concern extended towards staff, will understand that they end up whatever is delivered to them, will be cared about and valued too. So he's saying that work culture is not much different from ethnic culture. It's about people feeling safe and feeling as though customs and traditions are always there. But that's stabilising, something we can come back to. He also talked about people wanting to work even if things were very stressful at home and allowing people to do that. Not to expect everybody needs to take time out because for some people, work was all that they felt they could rely on. And so they could come in and spend as much or as little time as they felt able to. So now, a little further down, we have a really, really nice workplace and it's one we can all be proud of. And it might not be easy to put down in simple metrics as to what makes a successful or really great workplace or workplace culture because of course he was facing the challenge of having to supply the data. And in the immediate aftermath and even a way in, that was difficult to do. But he reports to me, that things are going really well for his organisation, which, by the way, is not a human service organisation, but an industry. So, it's not surprising, then, that his pride is evident, and he expresses this here. I have to say I'm very proud, because it's a competitive environment. It speaks volumes about how we were prioritising the right things, being staff, at the time. Another manager, just to show this isn't a rarity, also in um, an industry, not a human service organisation, says, and those are all the things I've learned since I started working for this company. And the things that surprise me is that it has a very, very strong social conscience, and that's helped me. And why did it help her? Well, not her words, but another participant's words. And I think, you know, that sort of realisation that actually life can be short, and it seems to be a common theme that actually everyone that I come in contact with are saying that the material things don't matter so much anymore. 
and another participant who is reflecting on tragedies, including the deaths that resulted from the earthquakes. Life is about the living, really, so it's about enjoying it and trying to help the people I work with. So are Christchurch workers in the aftermath of the earthquakes more oriented to values or just more aware? It seems it may be important to heed the holistic meaning making in which many workers and their families appear to be engaged at this time. People are choosing where, how long and how to work based on a clearer articulation of what is important to them. To have a hope of providing a good fit, sustainable value-based workplace practices may then be as important as sustainable financial plans. Thank you. <laughs>